It's a pleasure to be with you this afternoon and to have the opportunity to hear from and learn from a rather remarkable panel. As the dust settles on the election, it's clear that the implementation of Dodd-Frank promises to pose many interesting and challenging questions for the executive, Congress, and the courts alike. How will they deal with the structure of the new Consumer Financial Protection Bureau? with the implementation of the so-called too-big-to-fail provisions of the Act, with derivatives regulation or mortgage lending reforms? These are some of the questions on which our panel members will offer their expertise and insights today, and it's an honor to be able to introduce them to you. Starting from my right, your left, is Professor Michael Barr. He's a professor at the University of Michigan Law School. In 2009 and 2010, he served at the Treasury Department as the Assistant Secretary for Financial Institutions. In that position, Professor Barr was a key architect of the Dodd-Frank legislation. At Michigan, Professor Barr teaches financial institutions and international finance regulation. His recent books include Insufficient Funds and Building an Inclusive Financial System. Professor Barr previously served at the Treasury Department uh, under Secretary Rubin as his Special Assistant and as Deputy Assistant Secretary at the Treasury as well as a special advisor to President Clinton. Uh, he uh, served as a law clerk to Justice Souter and on the Southern District of New York. He received his law degree from Yale, an MPhil from Maudlin College, Oxford, where he studied as a Rhodes Scholar, and his bachelor's degree from Yale. Senator Graham uh, now serves as a senior partner at uh, US Poli Policy Metrics. And before that, he was vice chairman of UBS Investment Bank for nine years where he focused on providing strategic, economic, political, and policy advice to major corporate and institutional clients around the world. You undoubtedly know, however, Senator Graham best from his years in the Congress. He served 24 years in Congress, including the last 18 as a senator from Texas. And during that time, he served as chairman of the Senate Banking Committee. <coughs> senator Graham holds a PhD from the University of Georgia in economics the subject he taught at Texas A&M for over 12 years. He's published too many articles and books to even begin to list today on subjects ranging from monetary theory and policy to private property to the economics of mineral extraction. Mr. Haraf is managing director of the Promontory Financial Group in its San Francisco office, where he advises financial institutions on strategic matters. He served as the California Commissioner on Financial Institutions from 2008 to 2012. While Commissioner, he was named by his peers to be the sole banking, state banking commissioner on the Financial Stability Oversight Council, FSOC to the cognoscenti in the room, established by the Dodd-Frank Act. Earlier in his career, Bill worked for the Bank of America and Citigroup. He served as a senior economist on the Council of Economic Advisors during the Reagan administration and taught economics and finance at Brown and later at the Graduate School of Management at UC Davis. Last, but certainly not least, is John Allison. He's president and CEO of the Cato Institute. Prior to joining Cato recently, Mr. Allison was chairman and CEO of BBT Corporation, the 10th largest financial services holding company in the United States. During his tenure as CEO, BBT grew from $4.5 billion to $152 billion in assets. Mr. Allison is a former distinguished professor of practice at Wake Forest University School of Business and serves on the Board of Visitors at the Business School at Wake, Duke, and UNC Chapel Hill. He's a graduate of the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. He received his master's degree in management from Duke and is also a graduate of the Stonier Graduate School of Banking. Please greet and welcome all of our panel members. <laughs> So you have a sense of what's headed before you. We're going to start with uh, Professor Barr, opening remarks from each of these gentlemen. I might then pose a few hard questions, um, as uh, may be the case. And then we'll open it up some questions of your own. So feel free to prepare avidly your notes. Professor Barr. Thank you very much. Uh, for having me here. Um, thank you for that warm introduction, Judge, and thank you um, uh, to the Federalist Society um, for inviting um, maybe a view that is not the dominant view in the room. 
uh, to come speak. So I'm going to uh, talk about the uh, financial crisis and the path of financial reform that I think the country is um, uh, currently on. If you think back four years ago in the fall of 2008, the financial crisis uh, really devastated the U.S. economy and plunged us into a great recession that shuttered American businesses, that uh, led to widespread job losses, that wiped out home values and household savings. In my view, the crisis was rooted in years of unconstrained excess, both on Wall Street and in major financial capitals around the world. The crisis made painfully clear what we should have always known, that finance cannot be re left to regulate itself, that consumer markets permitted to profit on the basis of tricks and traps rather than to compete on the basis of price and quality will ultimately put us all at risk, and that financial markets break down, sometimes catastrophically, where there are not clear rules of the road, transparency, and accountability. For many years, a core strength of the US system had been a regulatory structure that sought a careful balance between incentives for innovation and competition on the one hand and protections from excessive risk taking and abuse on the other. And over time, those great strengths were undermined. And our regulatory system found itself outgrown and outmaneuvered. New markets developed for which the system was ill-prepared. And the growth of the shadow banking sector permitted financial institutions to engage in maturity transformation with too little transparency, capital, or oversight. <laughs> the years leading up to the financial crisis saw significant growth of very large, short-funded, and substantially interconnected financial firms. Legal loopholes and regulatory gaps allowed huge amounts of risk to move outside of the more regulated parts of the system to where it was easier to increase leverage. And entities performing the same financial function as banks escaped meaningful regulation on the basis of their corporate form. Banks themselves could move activities off balance sheet and outside the reach of more stringent regulation. Derivatives were traded in the shadows with insufficient capital to back those trades. And repo markets became riskier as collateral shifted from treasury securities to poor quality asset-backed securities. The lack of transparency and securitization hid growing wedges and incentives facing different players in the system and failed to require sufficient responsibility from those who made loans or packaged them into complex <coughs> instruments to be sold to investors. Synthetics products multiplied risks in the securitization system, and the financial sector, under the allure of innovation, piled ill-considered risk upon ill-considered risk. Financial innovation in many ways outpaced the capacity of managers, regulators, and markets to understand these risks and to adjust. And throughout our system, we had increasingly inadequate capital buffers. Short-term rewards overwhelmed or blinded private sector gatekeepers, and consumer and investor protections were weakened. Households took on risks that they often did not fully understand and could ill afford. Rising home prices helped to feed this financial system's rapid growth and also to high declining underwriting standards in the origination and securitization of mortgages. When home prices began to decline, these fault lines were ultimately revealed. And the asset implosion in housing <coughs> led to cascades throughout the financial system and then to contagion from weaker firms to stronger ones. Failures in the shadow banking system led failures in more regulated parts of the banking system. And then in the fall of 2008, our credit markets just froze. The over-reliance on short-term funding, for opaque markets, and excessive risk-taking that had been a source of great profit in financial capitals globally fanned a panic that nearly collapsed the global financial system. And I think four years now after the peak of the crisis, it makes sense to take stock of where we are uh, on the path of reform. In the U.S., passage of the Dodd-Frank Act in July 2010 ushered in a comprehensive system in key areas, creating the authority to regulate Wall Street firms that pose a risk to financial stability without regard to their corporate form, enacting a resolution authority to wind down these major firms in the event of a crisis without feeding a panic or putting taxpayers on the hook attacking regulatory arbitrage, restricting risky activities, and beefing up banking supervision, requiring central clearing and exchange trading of standardized derivatives and capital margin and transparency throughout the market, and establishing a Consumer Financial Protection Bureau to look out for the interests of American households. 
On a global level, the international community has put forward strict new rules on capital so that there are bigger buffers in the system in the event of failure. Capital and the riskiness of assets will be measured in a more conservative way, and capital levels will go up significantly. Systemically important firms will hold even higher levels of capital, and there will be new rules on liquidity and a global leverage limit. Despite the progress thus far, financial reforms faces some key threats. First and foremost, regulators need to finish the job of implementing the Dodd-Frank Act and new capital rules. Second, money market funds that were a core source of systemic risk in the crisis still are in need of significant reform. Third, the housing finance system remains in flux. Key decisions about the future of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac have been delayed. Regulators have yet to put in place new rules about risk retention and mortgage securitization. And key questions remain about how the U.S. will finance mortgages going forward. Fourth, as new reforms are, as reforms are being put into place, there are new risks developing in the system. For example, the use of derivatives and exchange-traded funds are leading to, uh, I think, uh, poorly understood uh, problems in that market that are undermining the stability of a product that was initially designed as an investor-friendly, simple, low-cost way to hold a broad index of, in of equities. Fifth, global reform and recovery can easily get off track, as we see uh, today in Europe. And lastly, while the U.S. financial sector has stabilized and the economy is growing, employment and housing are improving, but the continued crisis in Europe, slower growth in China, uncertainty in the U.S. about the political system's ability to deal with the fiscal cliff, all threaten to halt the progress and to choke off the recovery we're in. Despite these programs, I remain hopeful. The United States has before found itself in very difficult economic circumstances with very difficult political disagreements, and has nonetheless, in fits and in starts, and after many periods of trial and error, found its way forward. And so undoubtedly shall we in the current environment. Thank you very much. Makes me nervous being in a room with so many lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> Let me uh, begin by saying when I wrote the law that became Graham Leach Bliley, I was confident that by enhancing competition among financial firms that we could reduce the cost of financial services, that we could enrich the supply of financial services, and both of those things happened. I didn't necessarily buy the idea that Graham Leach Bliley was going to produce a series of financial services holding companies, and it didn't. But I would have to say that what I wanted was the market to decide what kind of financial institutions were competitive because I wanted then, and I want now, America to dominate the financial market in the world. <clears throat> financial strength is a source of political strength and economic strength and military strength. Uh, we see the decline of New York and Chicago on the global financial market, and it represents a peril to every American. A perfect example how, of how important financial markets are to the power of a nation is Great Britain. Great Britain hadn't been a significant manufacturer in 75 years, and yet it is a world power because of its financial markets. So I want America to be the dominant country in the world in finance. Now, let me start by giving you my view and what I believe is the factual view of the financial crisis. The financial crisis was made in Washington, D.C. Uh, it started in 1995 when uh, the Clinton administration, in earnest, turned CRA into a mandate that forced banks to make <coughs> subprime loans. As Alan Greenspan said, uh, before uh, the Senate Banking Committee, subprime loans came from CRA. And that was a constant growing pressure until the system collapsed. Uh, Congress, with the support of Democrat and Republican presidents, 
set quotas for Freddie and Fannie to hold subprime paper. Uh, those quotas grew, and by the time the wheels came off, they had to hold 57 cents out of every dollar of assets they held in subprime paper. This all worked well as long as we were in a housing bubble. But once the bubble broke, the default rate was massive, and banks held a lot of securitized mortgages, something they could have done uh, under uh, Glass-Steagall. They held large amounts of them because almost all of them were AAA rated, and under Basel II, uh, the capital you had to hold against assets was based on the assessment of the risk, and of course these AAA assets were virtually risk-free. When the real estate market collapsed, securitized mortgages that had been put together to trade, not to unwind, fell by multiple of value, and it destroyed the financial base of the financial institutions worldwide. <coughs> Now, I want to just talk about two myths and then go to my point. The first myth, which is behind uh, uh, Dodd-Frank, is that, th that the failure of Lehman uh, triggered uh, this contagion which took down the financial system of the world. All of the financial institutions in the world had the disease because their capital base was destroyed by the collapse in the value of securitized mortgages and under mark-to-market rules, it quickly affected every financial institution on earth. The failure of Lehman was simply an outward invisible sign. Uh, it did not represent any substantial change that triggered reaction. Um, but if you took that view and you took the view that the crisis occurred because of deregulation and because of risky behavior, and let me say, every member of Congress has an agenda, and whatever problem happens, that calls for their agenda. <laughs> and the agenda of the people who wanted government to control banking uh, was they wanted government to control banking, and when the financial crisis came, uh, their version of what happened led them to do what they intended to do to begin with. The second myth is the government had to bail out banks and large financial institutions because they were too big to fail. Uh, I would say that myth is generally accepted today. It is a total myth. If they had bailed out big banks, they might have bailed out seven banks. They might have bailed out 20 banks at the most. How many banks did they give capital to? 800 banks. Their objective to begin with was to go in and set up a bad bank, take the mortgage-backed securities off the bank's books, but quickly they figured out they didn't have a way of evaluating what they were worth, and secondly, they had to do this yesterday, and so they adopted what Britain had done, and that is simply forcing institutions, some that didn't want it, uh, one represented here today, uh, to take more capital believing this was a liquidity problem. Uh, so the idea that they bailed out the banks because they were too big to fail, they bailed out 800 banks. Now, that brings us to systemically important, and there are two sides of the story. Some people say that this doesn't have any great significance. I think it has great significance because I believe the market reacts to the designation or will when it's made, and I think it will lower capital costs for those institutions. I think it will give them advantage in the marketplace, and I think the result will be more concentration and I'm not for it if it's being produced by government guarantees. Um, now, I think the soft underbelly of Dodd-Frank uh, is too big to fail. Uh, I am confident that Congress in this session will begin to move against uh, uh, the designation of systemically significant institutions. 
I think public support will that will, for that will grow. We saw that in the first presidential debate. Uh, and I believe they will end up overturning that, and that will begin a 20-year period of unwinding a regulatory system which is unworkable. Uh, every bank in America, last point, is in a fortress mode today. Uh, and that uh, has helped produce the most disappointing recovery in the post-war period. And I don't see anything on the horizon that's about to change that. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Bill Harriff. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Judge, for the kind introduction. Um, the title of the panel is Dodd-Frank, What's Next? And I'll make a few remarks about what I think is next in actuality and then a few <coughs> remarks about what I think ought to be next. With regard to what's next, uh, we just had an election. It was a pretty consequential election. What does it mean for regulatory policy? It means pretty much status quo. Uh, I noticed the Senate uh, just yesterday confirmed Marty Grunberg and Tom Honig to the FDIC chairman and vice chairman slots. <coughs> Tom Curry now at the controller of the currency the FSOC well-established and moving forward with its agenda. And uh, what I would say about the tone at the top of regulatory bodies in the United States today is that it's very much regulatory risk off. We talk about market risk off, market risk on, regulatory risk off is very much the order of the day. And that pertains not just to safety and soundness, but also to broader issues relating to the governance and compliance, risk and compliance management of large financial institutions. I think one of the fair uh, observations to make about what the tone at the top is, is that um, as a result of the crisis, regulators really lost faith in the governance, risk management, and compliance management systems at these large institutions operating globally with a lot of complexity as, re as a result of all the various markets they operated in and their ability to actually control all of that risk. I noticed in the Wall Street Journal this morning uh, an article on the front page of section, section C <coughs> indicating that the OCC is going to introduce a formal enforcement action, a consent order on J.P. Morgan Chase because of its failures in the BSA in its oversight of its BSA program. These are pretty significant matters, and the journal reported that uh, more banks are likely to receive similar orders uh, from the OCC in the coming months. And then we have the CFPB, and the CFPB is an interesting new organization. Um, it's still in startup mode, but uh, focusing primarily on its statutory mission. Uh, it's gearing up a big examination program, hiring a lot of enforcement attorneys. We're starting to see evidence of them being active in the oversight of institutions, but it's too soon to tell what the ultimate impact of the CFPB is going to be. Um, I'm actually a big believer in what the CFPB could do. I'm not a big fan of what it's actually doing today, and <coughs> that takes me to my next topic which is not what's next, but what should be next. And here's what I'd say about that. First, with regard to the causes of the crisis, I heard uh, Professor Barr talk about uh, greed and innovation on Wall Street, credit rating agencies, the vast shadow banking network as a principal cause of the crisis. I heard Senator Graham uh, blame the crisis on Washington, D.C. And of course, there are elements of truth to both stories. But here's the one thing that I think we all have to confront. In the years leading up to the crisis, we had a, gr a global credit bubble that infected much of the developed world. And if you look at the period from 1990 up until the crisis, a relatively short period of time, uh, developed world economies had roughly a 50% increase in their average debt to GDP ratios. 
just an extraordinary explosion in the growth of debt over a relatively short period of time in these large economies. So if we're going to confront what led to the crisis, I think we really need to confront what produced that credit bubble, how did it gain momentum, what could have been done to prevent it from happening. And it's so interesting to me when you think about our Federal Reserve System established under the Federal Reserve Act to maintain maximum employment, price stability, stable low interest rates, and you look at the environment in the pre-crisis period, the Federal Reserve delivered on all of those mandates. We had high employment, we had relative price stability, and we had relatively low interest rates. But through that period of time, we experienced in the United States and elsewhere this very large expansion in credit overall. And so when you think about the fact that we've had crises throughout history under a variety of different institutional and <coughs> regulatory and market arrangements that have been <coughs> preceded by credit expansions in an important way, it leads you to think a little bit more broadly about how best to prevent these things from happening again. Maybe we ought to think about getting the Federal Reserve to focus on credit expansion as well as its other objectives, amending the Federal Reserve Act to get a focus on credit so that we prevent credit crises from happening. In this case, the credit growth took, came, took, came about as a result of a vast expansion in the shadow banking system. Part of it connected with the regulata regulated sector and part of it connected with the unregulated sector. Why, can, how can you explain this? Did, did we really have sudden, uh, a sudden infusion of greed on Wall Street? Well, we know that Wall Street bankers have always been greedy. <laughs> what, what did happen to change the environment, I think, is people became complacent after a couple of decades of the great moderation, or as Gary Gorton from Yale characterized it as the quiet period, a period without crises. So complacency, I think, drove a lot of the leveraging up of Wall Street, a lot of the financial innovation that we saw. And of course, an element of that complacency involved the so-called Greenspan put. Anytime there was any apparent threat to the financial system of the <coughs> United States, the Fed intervened <coughs> promptly and aggressively and maintained the great moderation um, until it could no longer do so because of the tremendous growth in credit and the bursting of the bubble and the aftermath of the decline in mortgage uh, in, in house prices. So I think that's an important element of this story and it suggests when we think about how to prevent these crises from happening again, the focus ought to be more broadly on the credit aggregates and maybe less on specific <laughs> regulatory interventions. And then that takes me to the CFPB. You know, if you look at the period before the crisis, um, something happened with consumer <coughs> behavior that was really very, very fundamental. The saving rate, which had been averaging 8 to 10 percent of personal incomes for most of the post-war period, started declining in the 1990s, and it went down to zero in 2005. Households across America st stopped saving. At the same time, they loaded up on consumer debt. A lot of that increase in consumer debt was mortgage-related, but not all of it. Credit card debt, student <coughs> loan debt, all forms of consumer debt exploded during that period of time. And now what we see in the aftermath of the crisis, what has happened to so many American households that, uh, found that find themselves now in the later stages of their lives, maybe heading toward retirement, with no financial assets. And if you really start thinking about what government might be able to do to solve that problem, it doesn't involve examining financial institutions for their practices. It doesn't involve going after bad guys. It really does, and it involves, I think, more than consumer education the way it's currently conceived. But I'm running out of time, and maybe we can get to those issues uh, during the Q&A. Thank you.
good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. I have a little different perspective in that I'm an actual banker. I was in the banking industry for 40 years, CEO for 20 years. Got to see the financial crisis and related events evolve over that period of time, kind of from the inside. Uh, the status have done an amazing job of creating a myth. And the myth is that uh, market failure and deregulation of the, of the financial industry caused financial crisis. It's just simply not true. Uh, first, the banking industry was not deregulated. There was a massive increase in regulation during the Bush year. We had the, the Patriot Act, the Privacy Act, Sarbanes Oxley, and you can look at the numbers, a massive increase in regulation. We were just misregulated. We were not deregulated. All that took the focus off the real ball. Uh, and secondly, the, the whole idea that the financial industry uh, was failure was caused by market risk doesn't make any sense in this context. Financial services industry is the most regulated industry in the world before Dodd, Dodd Frank. Uh, saying the most regulated industry in the world had market failures, a little bit of an oxymoron. Uh, the real cause of the financial crisis were a combination of errors primarily with the Federal Reserve. In fact, I've been through a number of credit bubbles in my career, the early 80s, early 90s, all caused by the Federal Reserve. In this case, uh, Alan Greenspan is head of the Federal Reserve, getting ready to retire. He wants to go out as a hero. And we're having a little correction in the early 2000s. He starts printing money, creates negative real interest rates so that you could borrow less than the inflation rate, a huge incentive for people to leverage. What happens when the Federal Reserve prints a bunch of money is we all think we're wealthier than we are, therefore we overconsume. In this case, the overconsumption went into housing primarily because of the actions of Freddie Mac, Fannie Mae, giant government sponsored enterprises that when they failed owed $5 trillion and had $2 trillion in subprime mortgages. They were the dominant market player uh, in the industry and they set the rules. Somebody with a 50% market share you cannot ignore. They drove down the standards in the industry and that's what created the bubble that ended up being focused in the housing market. It would have been somewhere else uh, based on what the Federal Reserve did, but that's what took it into the housing market. Um, I want to give you a context issue and, and even talking about Dodd-Frank. You have to see regulation as a whole. If you're an actual banker, regulators make up the law. We don't have rule of law in the United States. We have rule of regulators. Congress passed sound good laws. The regulators passed these massive regulations that if you tried to comply with every regulation, you'd, you'd be out of business. You couldn't possibly do it. The regulators know that. Uh, so they just choose what they're going to focus on when they're going to focus on it, uh, kind of based on whatever the kind of uh, the administrative will of the day is. Uh, and, and, and so, one of the implications of Dodd-Frank is not the concrete implication of law, but it's energized the regulators on all regulatory front. So there's this massive regulatory attack going on, not just in the banking business, by the way, that's not specifically related to Dodd-Frank. It's energized all these other regulations that were already there. Uh, one other context is that is fairly important is regulators have a profound impact on the ability and willingness of banks to extend credit. Uh, during financial crisis, and this happened in the early 80s, early 90s, I was there, regulators always tighten the lending standards. It's nice for the people at the top to say, we want banks to make loans. Well, if you're a local banking examiner, the only way you get in trouble is your bank gets in trouble. So what do you do? You come in and tighten standards. You tighten standards on good banks, banks that have had no credit problems. Exactly what happened at bb &T. We weren't making loans we would have made. We were putting people out of business. We shouldn't have put out of business because of the regulatory tightness. Now, here's what's ironic. This time, and slow the recovery, and Senator Graham hit this, they haven't let go this time. And they've had an interesting unintended consequences that comes out of Dodd-Frank in this regulatory mix. There's something called disparate treatment. And the disparate treatment is when you discriminate without discriminating. It's kind of an odd animal. And, and here's what's happening today. Small business lending is part science and part art. But if you exercise the art part, you're very vulnerable to getting uh, uh, charged with disparate treatment, going to jail, getting being fined an enormous amount. And there's a huge new focus on consumer compliance. So what's the easy out in small business lending? You mathematize it. And when you mathematize it, you have to radically reduce the risk you would ordinarily take in small business lending. My 40-year career, lending standards in small business today are the toughest they've ever been. And it has a huge impact on employee creation in the U.S., driven totally by regulators, not by the willingness of banks to take risks. Let's specifically talk about Dodd-Frank. Uh, one interesting fact is since Dodd-Frank was passed, there's basically been no innovation no creativity in the banking industry. And that's coming about from a variety of factors. Primarily, it's very huge level of uncertainty about what the law is. And secondly, the regulatory risk has gone up exponentially. So any innovation that's already risky has become more risky. And who wants to take that kind of risk? Uh, in addition, merchant acquisition activity has died. 
because you can't figure out whether the model for community banks that are struggling makes any sense. So big community bank acquirers like BB&T, we're not rolling up community banks right now because we can't figure out whether they're viable or not. When the industry actually, because of Dodd-Frank in a certain sense, ought to be rationalizing its cost structure. Um, very destructive factor. And I, I can tell you this personally, as, as a CEO, you can only focus on a certain number of things. When I was running BB&T before we got into this mess, I was probably spending 20% of my time totally wasted on regulatory issues, totally destructive. Now, my successor is probably spending 50 to 60% of his mental energy and focus on regulatory issues. That means he's less productive, his whole team's less productive, but in a great big bank, you've got a lot of other people to help. I came out of a community bank. I grew a community bank into a bigger bank. Community banks are killed because the CEO has to do that. So the community bank CEO is spending all his time trying to make regulators happy instead of doing what really makes the economy grow and pr prosper. The cost is staggering potentially, and particularly around consumer compliance. I'll give you an example. Consumer compliance people came into BB&T, asked us to produce a report that was 10,000 pages. 10,000 page report. They went into our mortgage servicing business. BB&T has the, by J.D. Powers, independent source, we've been ranked first or second in mortgage servicing quality every year for the last 10 years. And our clients are really happy, a lot happier than these other banks. However, the new rules that the, the consumer compliance people are threatening to put on our mortgage servicing business, we can't make the business work. Now, we, we haven't decided to exit, don't tell anybody we decided to exit the business, but we might have <laughs> to exit the business to make the consumer compliance people happy, even though our clients say they, they don't want what the consumer compliance people claim that they want. Um, the other thing is mathematical modeling. There is a religious belief in mathematical modeling among the regulators and government bureaucrats, despite the fact that all the models fail, by the way. All the city group models fail, all the Fed models fail, all the Treasury models fail, all the, all the models that the underwriters used, all the models that Standard Poor's Moody's fail, all fail. And yet, yet we're all spending, I mean, we've, we've got an army of people doing mathematical modeling, which is dangerous. It's dangerous because mathematical models can be useful tools, but if the judgment doesn't go into the process, they actually become self-defeating <laughs> because they don't, they don't allow you to take factors into consideration that aren't in the model. Um, credit allocation is another huge issue, and this relates to consumer compliance. Uh, under, under this law, basically, uh, the consumer compliance people can not only tell you what you can't do, but they can tell you what you have to do. Now, when the end, today, they're actually tightening lend, lending standards on consumers under the theory that we took advantage of a lot of people that they wanted us to make loans to, by the way. Anyway, uh, eventually, they're not going to like that because that's not going to work. So they're going to force banks to do subprime consumer lending, just like we had to do subprime uh, uh, home lending. That's the way it always works from a political perspective. Uh, capital ratios are really scary in terms of credit allocation. One way we got in this mess, under the regulatory goals, you had to allocate one half the amount of capital for a subprime loan than you did to a loan to Exxon. Now, what an incentive system. And if you're a status and you want to control the allocation of capital, all you got to do is move these capital ratios around and you will get capital allocated into subprime lending if that's what you want to happen. One of the biggest problems, the, cap the banking model is not viable under Dodd-Frank. And this is why it will change or we won't have a banking industry in the United States. Uh, it's not viable because it's really, it's a two-pronged attack. Attack one, we have to raise our capital, which I actually agree with. I think the industry is way undercapitalized. But attack two is the regulatory cost has gone off the chart. Our regulatory cost greatly exceeds our taxes. If you want to ask me, I'll be glad to pay taxes if we get rid of my regulations. I would say a third of our personnel costs in a typical bank today is, is regulatory cost related. The economics don't work. We can't incur the regulatory costs and have the capital and produce a, a satisfactory return on equity. There are no healthy economic systems that don't have healthy banking systems. Dodd-Frank will not work economically. Something will give. Now, what I'm concerned it will give will be the capital ratios. That's what probably will give, and we'll get all this regulatory stuff, which is counterproductive, destructive from an economic perspective, and we won't recapitalize the industry, which is what we ought to be doing. Uh, but you've got to let go of the regulatory costs or banks can't work with the capital ratios that have been demanded. Uh, community banks are the real victims of this. You know, the whole idea is that these small banks are exempt. That's a joke. Do you think a bank regulator is going to allow his bank to have different standards because it's smaller? That's, that's very naive. Community bankers will tell you that. The community banking industry is incredibly depressed. Uh, I grew up in community banking. I speak they're very depressed. They've got a combination of incredibly increased regulatory costs and, of course, uh, uh, 
the Fed has just decided to have no spread on the yield curves. They have no spread in their business. They're limping along, uh, but they, they can't make satisfactory returns on equity and, and make returns for their shareholders. One of the interesting consequences of all this, and I don't know whether this is intentional or not. I, I doubt it's intentional, but it's interesting. The ultimate effect of all this is going to be more consolidation in the industry. That's going to be the outcome. And, and over my career, the Fed, whether it's intentional or not, has set up a series of regulatory processes that have encouraged consolidation. We took advantage of that, okay? But that's what you should do in, in the marketplace. But they've encouraged, and I don't know whether that's unintended or not. Because if I'm a government bureaucrat and I want to control an, uh, 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 an industry, it's a lot easier to control 20 players than it is 6,000 players. So I don't think that the, uh, whether it's intentional or not, that is a consequence. And con Dodd-Frank will cause more consolidation in the industry because the economics don't work for community banks. You know, um, the idea of the, the too big to fail, if you're in the banking business and you're talking to people making decisions, nobody believes that. <laughs> they believe that Dodd-Frank has actually made too big to fail more more likely, and, and here's what's interesting, if we do have a crisis and they do let a large institution really fail, there'll be much more upset than we didn't have this because people don't really believe that too big to fail has been, uh, has been dealt with. What final thought, and this, I would call this has something to do with justice, and, and does it matter society when you're just or not? I'll give you an example of what I think an injustice is. The Fed, by its own admission, is arbitrarily buying down the yield curve to hold long-term rates lower. What does that do? That means it's savers, people that have worked in, in our business. We deal with lots of old ladies who are 85 years old, but they and their husband work their asses off and they saved a couple hundred thousand dollars. And they expected to live on the interest on that savings. And now they're eating the principal because the Fed has arbitrarily decided to hold interest rates to subsidize people so they can buy houses at cheap prices. That's an interesting ethical decision that bothers me a lot. And I'll tell you about how I feel about Dodd-Frank at bb &T. My company did really well through this financial crisis. We didn't have a single quarterly loss. And yet our costs, our shareholders have been damaged more than the shareholders of Citigroup who did contribute to this crisis. In my career, Citigroup has failed three times and been bailed out by, by the government. If they fail again, I guarantee you they'll be bailed out. I don't care what we say here today, unless the rules change, unless Dodd-Frank goes away. I think that's a form of injustice. And I think societies that people may not make con uh, concrete, when you punish savings, when you punish people for running things well, I don't think that works out in the long term. I think that's unethical activity and has serious negative consequences. Thank you very much. Well, Professor Barr, in, in the world I come from, there's a right of rebuttal. Uh, and you've heard a pretty thoroughgoing critique from at least a couple members of the uh, panel that the regulatory overhang created by Dodd-Frank uh, decreases economic activity and has, uh, and that it will lead to increased competition, decreased, uh, sorry, increased concentration, decreased competition, uh, and punishes savings and raises ethical issues. I, I think it only fair to give you a chance to, to, to reply. Th thanks very much, Judge. So let me, let me try and take some of these points in turn. Obviously, I, I disagree a lot with, um, a lot, but not all with what, what's been said. So uh, first of all, with respect to um, CRA and the affordable housing gold mentioned by, um, uh, by Senator Graham, I, I think that if you look at the academic evidence, um, the overwhelming bulk of people, academics who have looked at uh, both CRA and the affordable housing goals have found that they were not a prime driver of the activity that we saw in the financial crisis, not a prime driver. So if you look at the activity of, of Bear Stearns or Lehman Brothers or Goldman Sachs or any of the major players in the securitization market, they were not being driven by CRA. If you look at the role of the affordable housing goals, the overwhelming bulk of loans that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac were purchasing that were Alta or subprime mortgages were not eligible for the affordable housing goals. They actually increased the requirement for them to buy other loans in relation to that. So I'm not, a, I'm not a huge fan of Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac for a wide variety of reasons in their current structure or in their former structure, but I don't think that you can uh, describe uh, the Bear Stearns hedge fund as being driven by CRA, for example. Uh, what really drove uh, the uh, disaster in underwriting was uh, a massive increase in leverage, a massive decline in underwriting standards, and the opacity of the securitization system. And 
We need to fix that. I think we made a lot of progress in fixing that in the structure of the Dodd-Frank Act, and we need to finish the job um, of doing that. Um, I don't think that um, uh, with respect to uh, the comments um, that, that John made, um, that you can really uh, ascribe all the current ills of the financial sector, of which are many, or the decline in small business loan, which is real, uh, to the Dodd-Frank Act. Uh, financial institutions cut back, as they often do, on the downside of a cycle. Examiners get overly aggressive, as they often do, on the downside of the cycle. And you're seeing that now. It's been harsher uh, and worse because of the nature both of the uptick and the downturn than it's been in previous cycles. Um, that kind of um, uh, activity, I think, needs to be counteracted. I agree with John that it's a real problem that examiners have, uh, have tightened up a lot. Uh, but I think it's too easy to blame the current um, uh, tightening of lending on, um, uh, on the Dodd-Frank Act rather than that uh, broader uh, sort of trend. Um, I, I guess uh, with respect to the Fed's decision um, to uh, increase its balance sheet and to hold down interest rates, I think we would all be all worse off as a country um, if the Federal Reserve had not intervened when it did. Um, I disagreed with a number of the Federal Reserve and uh, Bush administration's banking policies in the lead up to the financial crisis, but once it hit in the fall of 2008, um, I think the Fed's decision to intervene at that moment and to hold down rates now uh, is actually uh, helping to sustain a recovery in what is otherwise a very, very difficult environment, both domestically and globally. Uh, and um, lastly, I think um, if you look at the basic structure of the Dodd-Frank Act, I think that it uh, makes it a lot less likely in the future that we'll face the circumstances that the Bush administration faced in 2008 when they decided to intervene in the banking sector. I think the whole point of the reforms that are put in place in the Dodd-Frank Act is to make the system more resilient to failure, to make capital buffers much larger and to provide the government with the ability to wind down a financial institution in an orderly way, to put it out of its misery, uh, to fire managers, to haircut creditors, to wipe out shareholders of a failed institution in an orderly way. Uh, and I think that will make it less likely that we have a problem of too big to fail in the future, not, not more likely. So thank you very much. P picking up on that, uh, Senator, um, you were talking about too big to fail. and. Uh, by my last uh, study, there are about 6,000 American banks, uh, but about half of the industry assets are concentrated in a handful of institutions um, whose combined assets total about 60% of our gross domestic product. Um, Dodd-Frank deems these banks too big to fail, systematically important, and regulates them specially and provides an orderly process for their liquidation, which uh, proponents say will ensure that taxpayers aren't footing the bill next time around. I heard you critique it a little bit to suggest that perhaps there's an implicit subsidy there and uh, that in fact it might be anti-competitive and create a barrier to entry. Um, you indicated that you thought there might be some developments in this area over the coming year legislatively. I'm curious what they are. Should we take a note from Teddy Roosevelt and engage in some trust busting? Uh, is Dodd-Frank the right medicine or what do you anticipate coming down the line? Well, 19 of the 20 trust supported the Clayton Act. Uh, so big business passed the antitrust movement in America. Uh, and by the time it passed, uh, 18 of the 20 were unprofitable and begging for government intervention to do things like to ban rebates on, fr on freight rates in the railroad. So uh, I think you've got to look at what is happening. And let me just make several points. First of all, if this problem had been caused by concentration in the banking industry and uh, banks involved in so many areas, uh, when President Obama came to office and had huge majorities in both houses of Congress. Since he had campaigned against Graham Leach Bliley uh, as the re-embodiment of Satan, in fact, he went so far as to f force Clinton to come out and say that he saw no relationship between Graham Leach Bliley 
and the financial crisis. And in fact, he paid me a great compliment by saying Graham is almost always wrong, but not always wrong. <laughs> uh, but my point is, if he really believed this stuff, don't you think he would have repealed Graham Leach Bliley? He had the votes to do anything he wanted to do. He not only did not repeal it, he used it to bring systemically significant institutions under the jurisdiction of the Fed. So we have in economics what we call reveal preference, and that is you don't need to listen to what people are saying, look at what they're doing. Secondly, the whole world <coughs> calls the financial crisis the subprime crisis. The whole world. Only among a small group of people in Washington, D.C., is it called anything else? Uh, in fact, in the new classic, uh, which I'm sure some of you have read, this time is different. Their conclusion is that the financial crisis was caused by, in simple terms, we made a lot of loans to a lot of people that couldn't or wouldn't pay them back. So the idea that CRA and the housing goals had nothing to do with the financial crisis is completely ridiculous. And I don't think anybody can, anybody can make a case of that. They can believe it, but they can make, they, well, I, I've never seen it made. So now, um, <coughs> let me just say a couple of things about what's been said. This Consumer Protection Agency, if you go back and look at the original bill submitted by the Obama administration, and you read the language of it, its objective is to politicize lending in America. It's not to protect consumers. It is to basically bring social values through community groups into determination about who gets credit. CRA is legalized extortion. It is legalized extortion. It is a process whereby you empower community groups to object to banks taking action, and in return, they are paid off. Uh, in fact, when I wrote Graham Leach Bliley, the final thing we finally agreed on was I wanted to force banks to report how much money they gave out under CRA, and I wanted CRA groups to report what they did with the money. And there was so much opposition to that. Good old uh, 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 let the light shine kind of legislation. But there was so much opposition to it that it almost killed the bill. And I was willing to kill the bill over it, and as a result, I prevailed. Uh, finally, I, I certainly agree with John. You're gonna put a third of the small banks in the country out of business under this thing. Uh, we now have small banks who are audited five times a year. There's a new audit under CRA. <laughs> Well, hell, there's no way they can do that. They got to prepare for the audit for two weeks. They got to respond to the audit for two weeks. Uh, uh, my son's little hedge fund, they have, I think, six employees, and they have to have a compliance officer. Uh, well, the good news is the big hedge funds have decided this is a pretty good deal because it'll now be harder for their best guy to go across the street and go in business against them because of the regulatory costs. So there's not it's a foul breeze that doesn't blow somebody some good, but is that the good we want? And what did hedge funds have to do with the financial crisis? Not a damn thing. But again, it goes back to the point I made. This was an agenda that had been dreamed about since the 1920s of basically giving government control of banks and beginning to collectivize loan decisions. And they got the opportunity to do it, and they did it. All right. Uh, uh, <laughs> Professor Barr, I'll get to you in just one second, but I, I want to. Yeah, very briefly. All right. The, the law that, that um, Senator Graham is describing is unrecognizable to me and was not passed by the United States Congress. So it is not the Dodd Frank Act. I'm not sure what act he's talking about. Uh, if you look at the em empirical evidence on CRA, I think the case is overwhelming that it was not a prime driver of the crisis, and most of the institutions doing most of the lending were not subject to it. 
I, I also don't recognize the institution that Senator Graham describes as being a Consumer Financial Protection Bureau involving politicizing lending in America. That was neither the Obama administration's original proposal, nor was it the act that finally passed. And lastly, with respect to Sunshine, I agree that um, Sunshine and Sierra is good. I was involved in the discussions with Senator Graham at the end of that, uh, of the graham leach Bliley Act, and both the Clinton administration and Senator Graham agreed that that was an important goal. We also agreed that we would, in that act, extend the period of time for small business, uh, small banks to have their CRA lending exam stretched out up to five years. So I think there were important things we can both agree on in that act. Well, Bill, I think it's only fair to let you in on this. And in particular, I'm curious, uh, again, just getting back to the question I asked uh, earlier, wh where you think SIFI is going um, in the future? And you had an interesting comment uh, right. about a study done recently over lunch you mentioned. Right, so some of what we were talking about earlier was uh, too big to fail. Uh, has Dodd-Frank solved the problem or not? And uh, John Allison, uh, Senator Graham also mentioned his, their concerns about concentration in banking, and I very much share those concerns. I do think we still have a too big to fail problem, but in a different form. One of the things Dodd-Frank did in its Title II orderly liquidation authority was uh, give the FDIC the ability to take over a large financial institution, wipe out the shareholders, haircut the long-term liability holders, and uh, stabilize the institution on that basis. W the costs in that case of such an intervention are not borne by the taxpayer. They're borne by other financial institutions. They'd be borne by uh, John Allison's uh, former bank, BB&T. And, and the guarantees that would be extended in such an arrangement would typically involve protection of uninsured deposits, protection of non-deposit liability holders, anything that could upset the liquidity and operation of near-term money markets almost assuredly would be protected. So we haven't solved the too big to fail problem in that sense because depositors, large depositors at John Allison's former bank might come to realize that that is an, a problem. They might tend to leave BB&T to go to one of the gigantic institutions because they would be more assured of protection overall. Uh, and, and, and that problem is gonna exacerbate concentration. I also agree with John Allison's comments that regulatory costs are very substantial for smaller banks. There's a big fixed cost component to compliance with regulation. And uh, it has an, un an inordinate effect on smaller banks and could well lead to further consolidation of an industry that, as the judge indicated, is already too consolidated. Uh, so I worry about that problem, too. And uh, let's see, there was one more thing. Um, maybe I'll stop there for All now. Right. Yeah. John? No. On what now? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I, 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 uh, can I, I respond to a lot of the comments? You, you, you may, and I, I remain curious what you think is going to be the future of the SIFI regulations and where it's going to go. Um, the, uh, well, um, let, let me, I, I'll go back to the context. I, I want to deal with a couple issues, one issue in particular that Michael raised, which I think is a fundamental issue that we haven't uh, that here. Michael retorted to my comment that I thought it was unjust for the Federal Reserve to take money from old people that had saved and, and co consciously holding down rates and give it to people to leverage them to, to buy homes. I thought that that was unethical. And his answer is, well, that was good for the community. And I find that interesting. Because I said what, for the country. Good, okay, the country, that's <laughs> different than the community. Okay, good for the country, which is, Versus, he's quite willing to sacrifice individuals who've earned those savings for the sake of some abstract community good, which of course, that's a very interesting idea because when you go around sacrificing individuals, doing injustices, does that in fact raise the community? Or do people get more cautious? Do they say there's some kind of injustice here? Should I be more conservative? Should I be more careful? Because somebody might take what I've produced and give it to somebody that hadn't produced it. Are there deeper consequences to this stuff? And I think those are important issues here that we can't, we can't let go of. 
In regards to the fundamental issue with the banking business is the Federal Reserve. Uh, I do not, credit bubbles are not possible unless the Fed provides the money. It's math, the, there was no private monetary system in the United States. In 1913, the monetary system in the United States was nationalized. The Federal Reserve owns the monetary system. Where did the money come from from the bubble? Yesterday at Cato, we had a monetary conference. We had Vernon Smith, a Nobel laureate, showing how the housing bubble was correlated with the Federal Reserve producing more money. <laughs> and he, he went back to 1900, and it's all, and every, we had a building cycle in the early 20, in the mid 20s. All of these things are correlated with the Federal Reserve producing money. Always trying to meet these goals that that uh, uh, we were talking about earlier. I personally think if you want to have a, a really want to deal with these problems, you have to get rid of the Federal Reserve or at least force the Federal Reserve to be disciplined. And I personally think it's a gold standard. And if you look at the history of monetary policy over long periods of time, whenever central bank authorities were disciplined by something they couldn't just print money, you don't get credit bubbles. You don't get the kind of misallocation we have. So you can work all the time regulating the banking industry, and maybe the bubbles won't be in housing, maybe they'll be somewhere else. But when the Federal Reserve overexpands the money supply and sends people to overconsume, they make bad investment decisions, and we get these cycles over and over again. And I've been through a number of them. This is the worst one in my career, but 1980 was pretty bad. So you can't fix the banking system independent of doing something about the Federal Reserve. And I think, unless you, and, and I tell you what, I think what we're doing now, you talk about a risk we're taking right now. We're printing money willy-nilly uh, all over the place. Uh, what kind of bubbles are being created? Who knows? We usually don't figure them out to after the fact. And so the regulatory issue is second to, to the monetary policy issue. Bill? Um, just a question of fact uh, with uh, John's assertions about the Fed printing money prior to the crisis. There's no evidence of that. If you look at the growth of the monetary base or of the narrow monetary aggregates, that is M1 and M2, That's in the decade and a half prior to the crisis, it was stable. Mm -hmm. And what happened is we saw a big disconnect between credit growth and monetary growth because of the emergence and development of shadow banking. That's what the Fed missed. Had the Fed seen it and been able to act on it, it could have maybe intervened earlier to prevent the crisis from getting out of control. But it was not a question of Fred, Fed money printing um, prior to the crisis that caused the credit bubble. Then, that, that's just what, not then, factually what, correct. What, what, I don't know what to argue about. <laughs> <laughs> and Bill, and, and, what, 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 what do you attribute to then, if, if, not, if not that? Right, so uh, we had a lot of financial innovation over a period in which the economy and financial markets have performed, had performed admirably for a long period of time. Uh, bankers, especially Wall Street, but the non-bank sector became very innovative in such an environment, produced a lot of credit outside of traditional bank intermediation uh, channels, and uh, literally ballooned credit as a result. Gary Gorton's uh, recent book, Gary Gorton from Yale, came out with a book this month, Misunderstanding Financial Crises. And it's worth a read. One of the things he points out in that book is that the shadow banking system in the time prior to the crisis, in terms of assets and total credit, was as large as the traditional banking system. And it grew that large in an incredibly short period of time. That was part of the problem. Now, I'm not uh, um, eliminating banks from blame because some of the large Wall Street banks were heavy participants in shadow banking through structured finance, repo, and various other arrangements. Okay, John. Well, first, uh, why did the shadow banking system develop in the first place? And the answer was a regulatory cross drew, drove a lot of credit outside of the banking system. Why did banks focus on real estate? Because the capital allocation was such that you could make a loan to a subprime lender and half the capital you could Exxon. So your capital, your, your ROE's got all screwed up. That drove business into the shadow banking system. Second, all these numbers on the shadow banking system are grossly exaggerated by people who don't understand what was going on. It's like the derivative numbers. You hear these massive quotes, but in order to hedge a relatively small interest rate risk, since you're only looking at the difference in interest rates, you have to do a billion dollar contract or hedge a $10 million risk. And it's just like the CBS market, you have counterparties going both ways. Most of these derivative things were actually interest 
rate or other kinds of risk reducing instruments. The other thing that people don't understand, who was on the other side of these high risk, what they call derivatives, they weren't derivatives, high risk bonds. They were very sophisticated investors. It wasn't mom and pop on the other side. Classic examples. Pension of, funds. Well, not had, well, here's an example, Harvard Endowment. The Harvard Endowment had 25% had compound returns uh, over a 10-year uh, okay. period. Doing what? Taking enormous risks. They knew they were buying risky stuff. They had these crazy things where they had offset one risk with other risks. A lot of the losses were justice to people that had been getting inordinate turns, taking inordinate, inordinate risks, and they got beat. And that's not bad. That's not bad. Mark, listen, market corrections are good. You want resources allocated to people that will use them more productively. The fundamental problem with the Fed is it keeps market corrections from happening naturally and makes the mistakes bigger in the long term. It compounds the error. It's just like not disciplining a 13-year-old. You're going to be real unhappy when they're 16. <laughs> <laughs> You've got to let businesses fail. Failure is absolutely as important as success. success. I, I know all about that these days. <laughs> uh, uh, Michael, back to you. Uh, I want to switch gears just a little bit and talk about the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Um, it's, it's an independent agency within another independent agency, the Fed, and it's presided over by a single director rather than a multi-member commission like the FTC, and it's isolated from removal by the President. It has a guaranteed budget drawn from the Federal Reserve outside of the appropriations process, and its decisions are unreviewable by the Fed and can be checked only by, uh, as I understand it bureaucratically, the FSOC, um, uh, which Bill knows all about. Uh, proponents say that this uh, unusual level of agency independence is warranted to protect consumers. Uh, opponents are concerned uh, about its structural integrity and consistency with mm -hmm. the Constitution as well as potential bureaucratic capture. Thoughts? Sure. Uh, let me just say one thing about the last question and then happy to talk consumers. I, I think there would be a mistake to imagine a world without the Federal Reserve as being some ideal world where there are no financial crises and no credit bubbles. I think we have a long history in the United States and in other countries of uh, having a fully private system, having a system with a weak central government, weak, weak central bank that resulted in financial crises. If you think about the financial crisis in 1907 in the United States, uh, it would be hard to find a better example of a reason why we wanted the Fed in the first place. All those cry well, the banks, so let me, let central me just, banks no, 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 wanted hang the on. Fed. Now I'm going to talk about consumer agency. Gentlemen, I'm gentlemen, responding gentlemen, to you. Gentlemen, so, let, let's, uh, uh, the, the question on the table is not the existence of the Federal Reserve. Oh, but John put it, it on the table. I, I know. John I'm, wants I, I, a fully I, I, private I'm, system. I'm not looking to blame anyone. I'm, <laughs> I'm just suggesting that maybe our audience would appreciate hearing a little bit about Dodd-Frank. So, Oh, I'd be happy to talk about Dodd-Frank instead of the laws that I've heard described earlier. I, so that would be, fair that would enough. be helpful I, I'm not, to me. I, I'm not trying to be critical of you, Professor, uh, that, or anyone be, on the That'd be wonderful. Panel. These are all very interesting <laughs> questions. Um, so the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, I think, um, struck a reasonable balance in its structure. There are lots of different balances that could have been struck. There are lots of different variations of the law that went through from our original proposal to the legislative process, I don't think there's a single one answer to the right way to structure, uh, to structure the agency. Uh, you know, if you look at the way the, also the controller of the currency is structured within the Treasury Department, it's an agency in which the director has uh, protections from removal. They're slightly different from the protections that are removal for the FDIC. Those authorities are slightly different from the removal protections for, uh, uh, for the CFPB. So there's an independent agency in the Treasury Department. It's protected from the influence of the Treasury Secretary with respect to rule writing and individual decision making. Uh, its budget allocation is um, made by charging fees to the financial sector. It is not a congressionally appropriated agency. So I think that there are lots of models of having an agency that is independent within another agency that is run by a single director that has budget independence and the CFPB is now one of those agencies. So I don't think it is a radical departure on the legislative landscape from other structures. If you look across the federal government at independent agencies, they have a range of different structures, a range of different removal powers, a range of different budget authorities, and I think that's okay. I think having a diversity of, um, of approaches is fine. I do not see any constitutional issue with that at all, and I don't see any problem with it in terms of uh, having an agency that runs and functions in an effective manner. Senator? Yeah, well, first of all, I, I think sort of the icing on the cake is the president 
appointed the director uh, who had to be confirmed by the Senate in a little sleight of hand way, uh, claiming the Senate was not in session when it in fact was in session. I believe the courts will strike that down and uh, I believe they'll throw the incumbent out of office and I believe they'll overturn all of his actions. I think it was extraordinary uh, that uh, the authors of this provision did not want Congress to have any ability to have effective oversight of it. Uh, and uh, I, again, I, that goes back, that, are we to assume that Congress is against consumer protection? I don't think so, but that wasn't their intention. The intention is to politicize lending, and there is a lot of opposition to that. So I think the structure tells you something. I would also say, look, I'm not against the Federal Reserve Bank, but the panic of 1907 is not a good example right. <laughs> for your case because in the panic of 1907, we had one hell of a financial panic, but the banks in New York got together and issued clearinghouse notes, and the panic lasted for nine months. On the other hand, you had the Monetary Commission Ida, uh, that came back uh, as in 1908. It gave rise to the Federal Reserve Bank. And come 1929, the Federal Reserve Bank uh, took the position that it wasn't its duty to provide liquidity, and it let a third of the banks in the country and a third of the money supply collapse. All right, at, at so this stage. It, it, the, the panic of 1907 is a case where the market did a hell of a lot better job than the Fed did in 1929 to 33. Now, I think the Fed's learned something since right. then. Oh, okay. <laughs> May, well, um, <laughs> Professor Barr, I, I think actually you do get now a right of response right. on 1907. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to uh, avoid responding and, and, on 1907. No, 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 no feel free. Feel Frank free. Guy. I think the door's been opened. Um, <laughs> And then we're going to go to questions from the floor. Yeah, so, so just, on the, just back on the consumer group, the Congress does have authority and is required to review what the CFPB does. The CFPB has to go up and testify before the Senate and the House, the relevant committees of jurisdiction. Their budgets are audited by the GAO. They have regular report requirements. They have an annual disclosure and transparency requirements. So this is not an agency that is not subject to review. Just like, just like the OCC, the Congress cannot cut their, cut their budget. The OCC has to go up and explain what it's about, but the Congress can't cut its budget. And this is the same basic approach. So the budget cutting authority of the Congress is not the only oversight of the authority of the Congress. The authority of the Congress what? extends to these other areas as well. All right, gentlemen. Uh, I'm sure we could continue on that in 1907 at some length. <laughs> but I see a line, a large line, forming. Uh, so there's obviously a lot of interest from the floor. We'll take the first question. Tell me what these guys say. My, my name is Bert Ely. I'm a banking and monetary policy consultant here in Washington. And I have a question for, for Michael, picking up on a point that uh, John particularly stressed. And that is uh, the future for community uh, banking. One of the indicators of a dynamic industry is you have new entry. Uh, and in banking, that would be the issuance of new bank charters. Uh, by my tally, there have been no new bank charters in this country since at least the beginning of 1911, other than banks that 1911? have been chartered. 1911? I'm sorry, 2011, excuse me, pardon me. Totally understandable under so, the circumstances. Thank you for getting me in the right century. Uh, but uh, there, have been, there have been a couple of charters that were, where banks were formed only to take over a failed bank. But it, for at least two years, there have been no new uh, brand new de novo banks. Uh, and it's, there's hardly any indication that we're going to see any new uh, banks started from scratch uh, in the foreseeable future. Um, and again, I think this picks up on a point that, that uh, John made, and that is this is a terrible uh, environment uh, for community banking. So my question, Michael, to you is, uh, to what extent does this concern you that we have no new entrants uh, into banking and uh, to the extent that you think that's a problem, uh, what should be done to try and rectify that problem so we start to get uh, new entrants uh, into the banking business? Okay, thanks, Bert, and it's great to see you, and I was, I was worried you weren't going to get the first question, which would have been <laughs> the first time, in have, any have no fear. Of, first time in any conference I've ever seen you at that you wouldn't have done it, so I'm glad you snuck in the front of the line there. <laughs> um, 
I'm very concerned about, uh, about the health of the community banking system. I, when I was at Treasury, I spent a lot of time meeting with community bankers, and even back now in Michigan, in my private life, I meet with community bankers quite a bit. I uh, just met with the Michigan bankers um, last week uh, about this topic. And I think we have to find ways of getting new uh, community banks chartered and opening up um, the lending spigot, if you will, for community banks um, and getting examiners to uh, see what is going on community banks um, with, uh, with fresh eyes. The, you know, the big issue that was facing the Michigan bankers, or one of the big issues I was, when I was talking to Michigan bankers last week was uh, BSA requirements um, and the filing of suspicious activity reports which um, don't add a lot to the security of our country. Um, and I think that could be an area that is subject to reform. I, I don't, uh, I think politically, uh, the Bush administration and, and the Obama administration, you know, didn't take that on, but I think that it is an important area to, to look at among other um, issues. So I think that the regulators uh, and policymakers ought to be sensitive to the effect of regulation on community banks. I think there are a number of measures in the Dodd-Frank Act that were designed to take account of those differences between community banks and larger banks. But I think continuing to look at that and find ways to streamline regulation on smaller banks makes a lot of sense. John? I think the question also implicated you. Well, I, I think that the answer is a radical reduction in regulations. <laughs> and, and also for the Federal Reserve to restore the yield curve to to get out of the way, let the market uh, drive the yield curve. Because I don't think community banks are the regulatory cost burden. That's that. It's not just Dodd Frank, but it's it's the whole regulatory emphasis of the current administration. And with a with a no yield curve, it, it just doesn't work mathematically. So we we are killing the community banking industry. And if it, and if it goes on for four more years, I don't see how the industry. I don't mean every community bank will fail or anything like that. But it, it, the industry will probably never be viable because you would have forced even more consolidation in the industry. So it would be, a, it, it would take, just talking to examiners would be a waste of time. It would take a radical change in the whole attitude of the regulatory structure, including repealing Dodd-Frank. We'll take our next question from the floor. Thanks, my name is Bonnie Wachtel. My family owns a small securities broker dealer, which I run. So this is a quick comment and a question about regulation for John Allison. I can tell you, we're not even under Dodd-Frank, but our examination schedule by the SEC and FINRA has been quadrupled in the last few years. And one of the examiners speculated that the reason for this was so many small self-clearing broker-dealers had gone out of business that they were now overstaffed in the examination <laughs> offices. And I don't think there is a single small self-clearing broker dealer in the country today, including ours, that is not considering leaving the industry. Going to exactly what you said. Now, here's the question. <laughs> so moving off for a minute, widening our scope aside from Dodd-Frank, you know, the Fed's got these interest rates low, partly to help the real estate market, but it's also supposed to be helping the economy overall and the employment situation and the whole situation. However, it is my understanding that the principal transmission mechanism for low interest rates is the banks. So it sounds like what you're saying is this avalanche of regulation is just smack dab in the middle of canceling out this effort to pick up the economy. And so all of it, you know, these policies are just completely counterproductive. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> You're totally, the Fed is a two-headed hydra. One head is the monetary people who don't talk to the regulatory people. And most of the, the, the smart people tend to be in monetary policy even if they make mistakes. The not so smart people end up on the regulatory side. The regulatory side is classic public choice. They, they care about the regulations. They don't want banks to get in trouble. So they've actually tightened lending standards while the monetary people are trying to, quote, encourage people to make loans. And it is much harder to make a loan. And your story about small broker dealers, we exited the business. And because the, the, math, the economics, you cannot afford the regulatory costs, which, and they don't lay anybody off. Uh, they just add, they, you know, they probably added some more staff because they got more budget, and then, they, and then they put more regulators on top of the people that are left. It's a, it's a destructive cycle down, which then causes more consolidation in the industry, which they claim is not their intended consequence, but I don't know. <laughs> Other thoughts on the panel? 
Next question, then. Kai Alberg, Port Angeles, Washington. Uh, two parts to my question. As I'm sure you know, there is a challenge to Dodd-Frank making its way through the courts right now. I'd like the panel's view on the merits and uh, likelihood of success of that uh, court challenge. A uh, second part, my question, uh, it seems that at the FHA there is uh, potentially another uh, mortgage bubble being hatched right now. From the latest numbers I've seen, there's about a trillion dollars worth of loans they've made or guaranteed with questionable credit quality. In fact, I believe if they were a private institution, they would have long have been shut down and liquidated by the regulators. <laughs> Uh, yes. Do you see another problem hatching there, and what, if anything, in Dodd-Frank will prevent that from replicating the 2007-2008 crisis eventually, if, if uh, left to keep going? Why don't we take the first question first, and then the second question second? Uh, and, and Michael, I'll start with you on the first question. Um, you know, as you know, there is a constitutional Sorry. challenge uh, that uh, has been brought, and Boyd and Gray, among others, represents the plaintiffs. And, He's concerned about the aggregation of power, I think, specifically in the, in the Consumer Financial Protection Board. Go ahead. Um, I, look, there are, there are a number of both constitutional and non-constitutional challenges being brought on the Dodd-Frank Act. I'll leave the non-constitutional ones to the side. There are cost-benefit kinds of challenges brought uh, uh, under a wide number of sections. Um, with respect to the constitutional challenge, again, I, I don't think that the choices that Congress made in the structure of the CFPB are outside the acceptable range of choices for how to structure an independent agency. I don't think it's a close call. Uh, if you look at the range of independent agencies out there and the range of budget authorities, removal power, congressional oversight, uh, independence, uh, all the indicia of um, those independent agencies and their structures, the CPB is well within the range of choices that Congress has made in history in those structures. So I am not worried about uh, that type of challenge. Now, with respect to the recess appointment in particular, I think there's a genuine debate about whether the recess appointment was conducted during a recess or not. I think that the view that the Department of Justice took in that is a reasonable view to take um, and one that is um, supportable but I can see why people would have a different view. I think the president was right under the circumstances to recess appoint uh, uh, Richard Cordray to that position because the Congress made clear that they were not willing to consider any nominee from the president unless the CFPB's law and structure were changed. So I'm not really sure that um, there was much option. Now, with respect to the FHA, I think that the, the basic issue um, that FHA faces, which is a real one, is that they made uh, quite a number of um, uh, bad guarantee decisions in the period 2004 to 2007 when the private market was also making a set of quite bad decisions. Uh, and Congress uh, blocked them from removing one bad uh, part of that decision, which is agreeing to guarantee seller finance down payment loans, uh, which is responsible for, at least as I understand it, about half of the losses that they um, have suffered in the last uh, five years. So I think there are real problems there. I think that the underwriting standards at, at FHA over the last couple of years have been quite strong. Guarantee fees have gone up. And on a going forward basis, they're in decent shape. But they are uh, suffering, I think, quite a significant problem uh, today. Well, let me say, uh, I'm sorry, but the facts don't bear that out. Uh, this is an agency that was in the black by most accounting standards, even though they have a totally phony accounting standard, where they can count as an asset their, their claim of their future earnings. They can claim as an asset the discounted value of their claim of their future earnings, and yet even though they can make it up, they can't make it up good enough to be in the black. <laughs> Now, their losses were m on loans that were made not under Bill Clinton, not under George Bush, but under Barack Obama. Those loans were made in 2009 and 2010, and as much as 10% of those loans have gone bad. And they were made under pressure. It's going to be interesting, because they're going to jerk the guy running this agent. Well, Report, that's yeah, not I'll the listen case. listen to what you had to say. Okay. Uh, they're going to jerk the guy running this agency before Congress, and they're going to put him under oath. 
And they're going to ask him, uh, and they're going to get the email trail from the White House. How much pressure was he under to lower underwriting standards? None. Okay, well, that'll be great because <laughs> they're sure as hell going to find out. And I think it is outrageous that all this happened after the subprime crisis. It shows we didn't learn anything from the subprime crisis. Uh, and in fact, their record is now worse than Freddie and Fannie. So I think this is a real disaster and a real black eye for the administration. And I, there's no doubt about the fact that this is going to become a big time issue, and it should become a big time issue. If we don't learn from the subprime crisis that A, you should have a real down payment, not three and a half percent that's fudged, and B, that you should have real underwriting standards, which they clearly did not. They made loans they knew were going to go bad. And I believe they were pressured to do it because it would help the housing market. Can I just do a quick rebuttal? Of course. Well, so if you do one, I'm going to do one. <laughs> we could spend all day here, which is fine with me, although I do have to get to plane. Um, but but if, you look at the, if you look at the auditor's report, the bulk of the loans that went bad are loans that went bad that were made in the lead up to the financial crisis, not well, that were made since then. And if you look at the underwriting standards at the FHA, they're stronger, not weaker, under Obama than under Bush. They got stronger under President Obama, the underwriting standards. If you look at the G fees, the G fees went up under President Obama. So if you look at all the basic indications of how's the risk management of the program doing, it's better now than it was four years ago. It is not, I should say, mean that the FHA is a healthy institution. The FHA has a lot of work to do uh, to come out of the situation it's in today. Well, right. let I me respond kind of by I, saying all right. that and then I think the change would like in standards doesn't fit the subprime crisis. Secondly, you got to remember, the Federal Reserve Bank put out a white paper suggesting that Freddie and Fannie <clears throat> make loans at a loss to help the housing industry. So I don't think it's far-fetched to suggest that FHA was pressured to make loans. Uh, in fact, All right, gentlemen, uh, Bill, Bill here would like to get a word in. You know, um, here we are four years after the nationalization of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, owned by the government, and, uh, and FHA with deep-rooted problems as well. Um, and yet, absent those entities, what is interesting to me is their private sector mortgage market is essentially not functioning. 90% of all the loans that are originated end up either in the, in the hands of Fannie, Freddie, or FHA, or guaranteed by them. Well, so, and in fact, since the crisis, there have been exactly three, maybe four, private label mortgage securitizations. The private sector securitization model is broken, and it's broken because investors lost trust in the origination processes and servicing processes as a result of the crisis. Those need to get fixed. That is the real problem. We need to get revitalized the private sector mortgage market and right now it's not functioning. John, can I comment on that? First on the FHA, well, if those losses are just now surfacing, that's gross mismanagement, right? Everybody else has already identified their losses years ago. Loss ratios are improving in the private sector. Even Freddie and Fannie are improving life loss ratios. So if those are, I don't know whether they're old or new, but if they're old, that's incredible. That, that, the, the people running that would be in jail if they were private people. That's on the FHA. Yes. Two, the FHA lending standards have been, they have been loosened. You know, we're in the mortgage business. It's easier to make an FHA loan. We, all the stuff that was going in the subprime market is going in the FHA. The reason that there's no private markets, how do you compete against the government? Because what they're doing is crazy. The interest rate risk they're taking is inordinate. So if you're owned by the government, your cost of capital is less than any private institution. So how do you compete with somebody that's owned by the government, can do stuff that shouldn't be done rationally in the marketplace, can take risks they shouldn't take? I mean, we would love to be back in the portfolio business, but as long as Freddie and Fannie exist, I guarantee if you said tomorrow that one year from now Freddie and Fannie and FHA are going away, 
there would be a very healthy private lending market for home mortgages in the United States, and we'd have a less risky banking system because home mortgage done properly, which I did for a long time, is one of the least risky loans. And one reason the Canadian banking system is done well, there's no Freddie, there's no Fannie, there's no FHA. They do have well, they some. Have a, they have a massive government insurance system that but guarantees most mortgages in the country. They have some insurance yeah. system, they have but some nothing. some insurance that is run by the government that insures most mortgages in the country. No. Yeah. Uh, uh, all right. Um, well, with, with that, that yes and no, when, when you get to yes and no in an oral argument, you, you kind of know it's time to move on. We'll, we'll take a question from the floor. Hi, I'm Jim Rockett. I'm the past chairman of the Financial Services Group of the Federal Society, and I practice uh, banking law, regulatory law. And, and I've got kind of a three-part cost question here, which interrelate, okay, which is, first of all, the CFPB and Dodd-Frank are going to drive up the cost of consumer credit dramatically. That's going to be driven by uh, a cost of compliance, which many, and I, the majority of my clients are community banks, most community banks cannot afford, okay? The third thing we're talking about is the cost of capital. We've heard from the entire panel that the cost of, that, that the way we solve many of the things that went wrong is to have more capital. So the cost of capital to community banks is in order to actually be successful, you've got to make money. You can't make money when you're spending, as John Allison said, a third of your, of your revenues uh, in, or your, what would otherwise be profits in regulatory costs. And this is driving up the cost to, to consumers and basically consolidating the consumer credit in a very small group of, of, of banks, okay? And I'd like to start with Michael. How can you justify that construct and believe that this is actually going to help consumers? And, and when we do, when we say that's going to help consumers, how do we keep <coughs> community banks in a marketplace where the cost of capital is so high and the cost of compliance is so high? Let me just uh, respond at a high level and then I'm um, uh, happy to pass it on. But I do think that the regulatory community needs to be aware of the costs of regulation. But we also need to be aware of the, and, and of the cost of cap. We also need to be aware of the costs of not having the right regulation and the right levels of capital before the financial <coughs> crisis, which was a financial crisis that devastated our economy, that blew up our uh, financial sector, that ruined American businesses and households. So. I think that when you think about the costs and benefits of regulation and capital, you need to be aware of the downside of not having enough of those things or the right kind of those things as well as the downsides of having uh, that mix. That being said, on any given rule and, and, and in the regulatory's assessment of how the rules roll up and stack up together, I think the regulatory community should be assessing how much this is costing the financial sector and ultimately consumers. And I think they should be acutely aware, as I think they are uh, increasingly trying to be, of the differentiated impact of rules on consumer uh, and community lenders in, in across the country. So that's, that's the approach I think that ought to be taken. We can disagree about any particular approach and whether it's doing that. Anyone else? Well, I, I would just say that I, the, the simplest way to not get in violation of a formula that is judging your lending decisions does not lend in that area. And so all this has a terrible impact that it means that fewer people that are, have moderate income end up having source, uh, having access to credit. And people that would have paid the money back and would have built better lives for them and their children end up not getting the loan uh, because Banks don't want to make them alone and then have to justify how they made a character decision and excluded other people. And so the net result is you end up with the credit not going to those people. And um, I, it, this, I don't know how you get around it other than going back and recognizing that not everybody is, has equally good credit. Well. We have about 15 more minutes left, and I will get to another question, but <clears throat> Professor Barr has to leave us now to catch a plane. Any final thoughts before you do so, Professor? Thank you very much. Thank you. 
All right. I think we've got time for a question, maybe two. We'll see. From Mark, Mark Maisner from the New York chapter. Uh, my question is for the panel. What does it say about the financial crisis that the housing bubble spanned across most developed countries despite their different monetary policies and regulatory regimes? Bill, you want to take a stab at that first? Yeah, I, I think it's a very relevant observation, as I mentioned in my remarks. Uh, clearly, what we saw was not related to Fannie and Freddie fundamentally. We saw these, um, uh, a mortgage bubble, if you will, that spanned uh, at least the UK, Ireland, Spain, as well as the United States, and uh, other countries to a lesser degree. So when you start thinking about, well, what really happened here and how do you fix the problem, uh, you have to go beyond current institutional arrangements, even though I would be the first to acknowledge that Fannie, Freddie, and the whole government guarantee programs for the housing sector were part of that problem. Okay, and I react to that. It, the Federal Reserve is the world's reserve currency. If the Federal Reserve makes a mistake, it gets transmitted throughout the world, which is why we need a gold standard. We don't have to get rid of the Federal Reserve, we need a gold standard, because the Federal Reserve, we, the same thing's happening now. Uh, when we, we export uh, our errors because we are the world's reserve currency. And we didn't have a housing bubble in lots of places. We had housing bubbles in a few places, for, I mean, relative to the world's economy. It, there was housing bubbles in some places, but there were other problems in other parts of the rest of the world. There were you know, commodity bubbles in a number of places. So just seeing this thing as totally a housing bubble is a mistake, but you definitely uh, can relate it to the Federal Reserve being the world's reserve currency and, and everybody else matches us. That's what, exactly what's happening now, of course. Uh, we're exporting uh, uh, commodity expansions on all over the rest of the world because we are the world's reserve currency. Senator? Well, look, Freddie and Fannie didn't cause a housing bubble, but the quotas on Freddie and Fannie requiring 57% of their paper be subprime loan induced them to enter into a contract with Countrywide. You remember Countrywide, the head of it came to Washington and declared, we're making loans with the lowest standards in history. <laughs> Anybody breathing can qualify. The head of HUD kissed the guy in the mouth. Uh, <laughs> Fannie and Freddie entered into a contract to buy all their paper and virtually all of it went bad. So that we did have a housing bubble, and it did let this process go on longer than it would have. But in the end, it was that the paper was toxic because of these bad loans that were made to people that either couldn't or wouldn't pay the money back. We have a stalwart who's waited all this time. You get the last question for the Excellent. panel. Excellent. Um, there's been a lot of, I'm Hester Purse from the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. There's been a lot of talk about too big to fail and Dodd-Frank, but I think one, one too big to fail entity that was created by Dodd-Frank and no one can dispute is derivatives clearinghouses. So the notion of forcing derivatives to be cleared and to sit in these clearinghouses was intended to make the system more stable, but if one of those clearinghouses has a problem, we could have a huge too big to fail entity. So I just wanted to get folks' comments on that. My reaction is to radically increase the risk in the, in the derivatives market. At first, the derivatives market did not quit fun What real derivatives? Uh, BB&T, we had derivative contracts with Lehman Brothers, uh, uh, Bear Stearns, Goldman, everybody. We manage those risks. We've done it for whatever, 75 years we've been doing, doing business with those people. So what happens in the, deriv in the private derivatives, we make a deal with Bear Stearns, for example. We'll set a limit on how much they can owe us, and they'll set a limit on how much we can owe them. And if they owe us more than that, they've got to put up cash. So we didn't lose anything when Lehman fell. We didn't lose anything when Bear Stearns fell. We could have lost a nickel, but it's trivial compared to the risk in residential real estate lending. The, 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 the whole idea that the derivatives market didn't work, one of it's because they add all these numbers together and they grossly exaggerate the real risk in it. Second, they don't recognize that the vast majority of contracts are between people that have different risks. bb t might do better if interest rates rise. Uh, XYZ might, might do better if interest rates fall. So we just trade the risk around. 
So we're both reducing our risk. So the derivatives market never failed. Now they call a lot of these esoteric investment interests derivatives. They weren't derivatives. They were just high risk bonds. It's something backed by low risk loans, high risk loans. And, and, but it hadn't had nothing to do with the derivative market. They were just high risk instruments bought by very sophisticated investors who were taking enormous risk in it. Well, I, if I could just add to that, credit <coughs> default swaps, the, the uh, the demon in all this, uh, I don't. It did. They didn't. They didn't eliminate risk, and they didn't distribute it as widely as we had thought. But they distributed it wider than it would have been. More banks would have failed without credit default swaps and failed with them. The market never broke down, no. uh, and it performed remarkably well, given that companies that were major issuers of credit default swaps went broke. So I think, again, this is one of these myths that is created that credit default swaps were part of this problem. Uh, and again, it's created by the desire to have an end to the debate. Uh, and again, I don't see anything, uh, any evidence whatsoever that the world would have been better off without credit default swaps. Uh, it, it's quite the contrary. Yeah, I agree that you know the swap market per se, you know traditional interest rate swaps, foreign currency swaps, and the newer uh, credit default swaps, you know performed mostly well uh, throughout the whole crisis. You know the problem in the credit default swap market toward the end was that we had the buyer of last resort for credit default swaps, and that was AIG, which basically took on about a half trillion dollars of mortgage risk in the, in the period prior to its failure. And it was truly, in some sense, kind of a rogue operator in that marketplace. I don't think you can blame that problem on the swap, the operation of the swap market overall. Well, with that, will you join me in thanking this panel for a very informative afternoon? Thank you.